All right, uh, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the Museum of Art and our, for our Art Break Lecture Series. My name is Sarah Asnab. I'm one of the fellows here at the museum. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lisa Zahabi. She's an assistant professor of interaction graphic design in the Department of Art and Art History. She previously served as faculty at the University of Maryland in College Park and at Weber State University in Utah. <clears throat> Uh, she earned a Master of Graphic Design degree from North Carolina State University and a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree with a concentration in Graphic Design from Eastern Michigan University. Um, her creative design work is also metaphorical and explores how the nature of search manifests itself in visual patterns and sense making, how the digital re uh, record influences memory and our understanding of history, and how language and image intersect within the context of the internet. So let's get her a warm welcome. All right, everyone. So I have a thing I'm going to read. This is my artist statement. I'm guessing most people probably haven't read it for this project. Um, so it should only take me about five minutes and then we can kind of open it up if there's questions. So the ubiquitous flood of images, text, memes, video, and digital interfaces that fill our various screens have become, paradoxically, both overwhelming and commonplace. Our human experience is increasingly influenced by information found online and mediated by computer code. This is the strange yet mundane context that informs and influences my work. Programming code remains largely hidden from the average user, quietly running our devices and altering the way we experience the world. It is an obfuscated layer floating beneath our conscious understanding of daily life. We breathe it in and out, never noticing how this framework shapes our behavior. Despite the fact that digital technology is a near constant presence in our lives, many humans who use these devices and interfaces cannot read nor write in code. While this situation is likely preferable for most of us, it does mean that this layer of information, the code, is only visualized and consumed through the end products. I argue that the code itself is beautiful. The patterns created by the grammar and syntax of coding languages offer a satisfying repetition, and the use of server-side scripting, databases, and personalized information can leave breadcrumbs and surprises throughout the long lines of text. Code is data that includes instructions for its own construction. Content and form are bundled together in pure abstraction, which can be viewed as such in a text editor or can be enjoyed as the final output in a web browser or as the elements of an operating system or a piece of software on a computer screen. The project, Code Has Weight, will eventually consist of a set of five handbound books. Each book contains the source code from one well-known and popular website. Amazon, which is what you see here, .com, Facebook, Google, Netflix, and YouTube. The text has been carefully typeset, following the conventions of fine typography and book design, including chapter headings, drop caps, folios and page numbers, and illustrations constructed of snippets of code, typeset in multiple fonts and styles to further illuminate the patterns and anomalies within. So I do encourage everyone to pick up and look at this book. It is meant to be picked up and leafed through. I know normally in the gallery space, we don't do that, but please do pick this up and, and look through it. That's the whole point of the book. So now I'm gonna talk about the other two digital pieces. So the affordances of the internet, which is a vast free form networked system of publishers and consumers have altered the ways we perceive and share information and misinformation in the last few decades. Specifically, the spread of information has been an enormous part of our experience of COVID-19 and the events of 2020. Public news media, governments, organizations, social media, and individuals worked, in turn, to terrify, to inform, to overwhelm, to connect, to inspire, to offer hope, and to offer, offer laughter as we all desperately sought to make sense of our collective situation. We look to online information for answers, for community, for something to feed the fires of our outrage, for something to fight our sense of unease and boredom. 
Songwriter and UNH professor of communication, Kevin Healy, responded to this onslaught of information and misinformation by writing and performing original music. And he asked me to respond to two of his works visually, which is what you see here and then back around part. Dolphins in Venice, which is not this piece, it's the other piece, feels deeply nautical and steeped in the past, rich with themes of illusion, nostalgia, surrealism, and artifice. The raw materials for that piece, which I cut apart and reconstituted, came from the open source digital archives at the New York Public Library and the Smithsonian Museums. The visuals do not directly illustrate the ideas found in the lyrics, but instead evoke sensibilities that build on the tones of the music and the emotions of the lyrics. I also chose to reveal physicality of the images, showing the viewer the edges of vintage postcards, the boundaries of etchings, the imperfections of prints. Angry Outsiders has a much different structure and sensibility. Here, the driving beat and contemporary themes bring to mind more vivid images and colors, an edgy, even grungy aesthetic and the irrepressible march of time. Themes of information, overwhelm, anxiety, decay, dissonance, transparency, and tension become part of the visual exploration. Again, the piece does not directly illustrate the concept, concepts in the individual lyrics as they appear, but instead mimic the overall themes and sensibilities of the sounds and the words, pulling contemporary images from Creative Commons image websites and incorporating mainstream news footage in my own illustrations. So as creators, we understand the special seductive allure of media content and the ways it can deeply affect and influence those who consume it. This is what creative work does so well. It grabs your attention ferociously, forcing you to pause and ask questions, to deeply consider things, lingering for days, for years, for a lifetime. Information and misinformation operates in the same way, invading our understanding of the world, coloring everything and everyone we see, creating a filter that persists long after we've forgotten where we even read something in the first place. So that is my statement. These are the pieces. So again, there's another one around the corner, but I would love to just welcome questions or you know, if anybody has any thoughts about the work, I think we can just have a conversation. Yes, Julie. Um, in regards to your book, which I did, I love being able to handle it and touch it as an artist where usually you have to wear gloves and blah, blah, blah. Um, is that an addition? Like, are you, I know you said there's going to be other volumes of it uh, with like Netflix and um, Yahoo, Yahoo, YouTube. But is this one, is there an addition to it? Is it just one of one? At the moment, it's one of one. Yes, it, it is. It, it just sort of stands alone. This was a great one. So I, I started this project actually several years ago, and this is what happens. We have an idea, right? And then we maybe start get started in it. And I tend to, as an artist and designer, come up with very complicated ideas. <laughs> Where I'm like, oh, sure, I'll take the source code for like all these different websites, and then I will typeset them by hand, right? And then make these books. And so I actually started the project, I came up with the idea in 2016, and I started the project in 2018, and then finally made an actual book <laughs> for the show, because I had to, because that's how this works. <laughs> you have a deadline and you're like, oh, okay, I have to make the thing. So at the moment, it is, it is an edition of one of one, but the great thing about digital work is that, hopefully, now that I know how to make this, right, I figured out how to make it, now uh, my plans are to make an edition of, I don't know, maybe 10. And then more importantly, I really want to get the others, right? Because I wanted there to be a comparison. This is what the source code for Amazon looks like in this form. This is what it looks like for Facebook, right? This is what it looks like for Google. So then you can see the books together and kind of have that connection. So that's next, that's what's coming next. And hopefully it won't take me however many years that is to make the next one, but you do it more quickly. Did you have a follow-up? I have to follow-up, because I don't know that much about source code. Does the source code change for that particular, like is that a picture of that source code the day that you took it and now it's probably different to look at it? For sure. Okay. 
which was actually the fun thing. So this was from Amazon. So I opened up my Amazon account and I'm hoping all of you know this, but like Amazon has all the goods on you, right? Like it's keeping track of all these pieces of data, even if you're really careful, which is what my husband does. He like clears out all of his cookies, right? He's very careful about his online you know, world, but I don't. I'm very much more free form. <laughs> I just figured they're gonna know anyway. So uh, there's all these little bits in here, names of my friends, right? Uh, names of products I've ordered. Um, and so it's really interesting to see that snapshot of that moment when I took the source code, because all of that, all of that's constantly evolving and changing, which I thought was also interesting, right? So I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Yeah, done. Somewhat related, um, with the source code, is that source code specific to a function of Amazon, the Amazon page. And in, the, in other words, I mean, you know, a, the source, I'm sure the source books of Amazon could probably fill this gap in a museum. So I was just wondering, like, were you, were you taking a particular segment of the source code and how that impacts um, sort of like the, the content of it? Or you take the sample to basically talk about source code in a large category? Another really great question. And so with all of these websites, they're all very much dynamic interfaces at this point. So the source code, if any of you've ever done web design, right, like design a web page, you can look at that code that generates what the, the web page looks like, and it's going to be a little bit more simplified. All of these are dynamic websites, meaning that they are using databases and they're pulling from all these different sources to generate that snapshot that Julie was kind of asking about. And so I, instead of going to like, oh, this is what my wish list looks like on Amazon, this was the home page, but for my account, okay. right? And then your account then would look different from Michael's, right? And then if we just had no account open, it would look different too. So yeah, so if I had dug into a different page, that code would completely, not be completely different, but it would be different, yeah. Yeah, Leah. So you have this information and you make a blog, but you also have your video images. How Separate. does the development using those two different ways to, to visually see the material, do you find that that changes what you're interested in, in exploring in the, the data moving forward? Or like, how does that work for you? That's, that's such a great question too. So the, the, the content for this piece and the other one came from the music that Kevin Healy wrote, right? So we collaborated on that. I think the projects are connected because they're both about information, right? So the things that Kevin was really thinking about had to do with, um, so dolphins in Venice came from the story that there were dolphins, right, swimming in the canals in Venice during the height of the COVID pandemic, which has later sort of been debunked, right? But everybody wanted to believe like this magical thing was happening amidst all of the horribleness, right? Um, so that piece was about this idea of misinformation, as is this, right? This is really inspired by the, the January 6th riots at the Capitol, among many other things, right? Um, so the connection to me is information. So this is all about taking code that we don't see and trying to make it visible in a different way, like really, really just sort of showcasing that. Whereas this is sort of taking all of these images of things that maybe we do see all the time, but kind of exploring a different way of visually seeing it. And of course, there's music that goes along with this too, that I think helps to inform the experience of these pieces that we muted so that we could all hear. <laughs> but um, so in terms of my experience as an artist or a designer, I think I'm thinking about a lot of the same things when I'm making this piece versus this piece but it does let me sort of showcase it in a different way. The constraint for this was it had to fit with music I didn't write, right? I was collaborating with a musician who was making this work and then thinking about, well, it needs to be this long. These are where the beats are happening in the song. This is where some of the ideas are happening. And then just kind of, you know, jumping off of that in, in, in terms of the visuals that I made. Um, so it's, they're both about information, but definitely different ways to explore it. Thanks, Leah. Good question. Good question. What else? Do any students have questions or thoughts? Yeah, Adam. All right. What gave you the idea for? 
So part of it was we're so used to seeing, you know, so code is text. That's all it is, right? It's just, it's text. The whole internet is files and folders and text, which is sort of mind blowing. Um, and so I, you know, I guess in some ways maybe it was obvious as a choice to say, oh, I'll make a book out of all this text. But it's so different from our experience of code. We're always seeing code on a screen. And so it was sort of taking that idea of making the uh, familiar unfamiliar, but through a familiar object. <laughs> so it was kind of just playing, hopefully in a slightly cheeky way, playing with that idea of, okay, well then let's just set it as almost like a novel that you would read, although no one would ever read this code because it would put you to sleep and it doesn't necessarily make sense. But it's nice because some words do bubble up and become really interesting. And so I did make, you know, pages where some of that is highlighted. Let me see if I can find one. Right, like this, where it's pulled out. These are my illustrations, right, that I made all out of text. And they're pulling out things that I discovered while I was very tediously, meticulously typesetting all of this, right? And so these are the things that I was like, oh, well, that's really interesting. Or there are words here that people might understand, right, or find to be interesting. So yeah, that's kind of why a book. Also, books are awesome. Making books is amazing, right? Michael knows, because Michael teaches a <laughs> class on this. Um, but it's just really, it's also just was something I was comfortable with and seemed like a really interesting way to work with this kind of material. I also do code. I work with code, I code things. So it was interesting to kind of cross over to something like this and play with it in a different way. And Amazon started as a bookstore, basically, right? So it did. I really thought of that, but I thought it's Yep. <laughs> so of course, yeah. Back to its roots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, back, back to the thing, yeah. So I don't know how we're doing on time, but yes, please, another question. Uh, I was just wondering how your idea of the book project morphed from the idea in like a teeny dog as you were doing it. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I think in some ways it did. I mean, it was pretty straightforward. It came, it came to me, and this is what happens to me. I'm sure it happens to a lot of other people who are creative too. It was sort of like a burst of inspiration of, oh, oh I'll try this. Um, it definitely did change a little bit because as soon as you had that idea, I had to make a bunch of decisions. How big is the book, right? Meaning, like, how big is it? I could have made a giant, right, like coffee table book. That would have been a different experience. What fonts do I want to use, right? What colors do I want to use? How do I want to, you know, put all of this together? What details do I want to include? So I would say the idea morphed in that way when I got into, like, those specifics. Um, but I really, this was one of those where I really did have that idea and just kind of had to put in the time to execute it. That doesn't always happen. <laughs> there are plenty of times where I have to abandon them, right, and totally leave them behind, um, or where they do wholly change, right, into something completely different, including even thinking, oh, I'm going to make a book, and then it becomes like a video, right, or an animated piece. So I hope that answers your question. Yes. Okay, good, good, good. And like I said, I do encourage everyone to wander back, not during the other two talks, but wander back at the end and check out the other piece that's kind of about behind the corner. Because that one I actually worked on during the pandemic, the Dolphins in Venice piece, and it was so soothing because it's all sort of very vintage, nautical imagery I was working with, and I needed that. I needed a project like that to work on that just kind of felt soothing and uh, the imagery were things that I think just looked very beachy, like it was almost like I was traveling when I couldn't travel. Um, so I definitely encourage you to go check that one out because it has a very different flavor from this piece here. So we're good? All right. Thanks, everyone. Great questions. <laughs>
did a wonderful job in sort of designing and setting up this environment here for my work. Um, the impetus was, I, you know, at, for the beginning of these shows, it's just kind of like you send them a bunch of images. And my concern was I have all these pieces that have always worked at sort of table height. And then when you have a lot of sculptures, the difficulty is you were afraid that you enter an exhibition where there's just kind of like a forced pedestal. So coming in, seeing that they've arranged this organization, the pieces, the placement of the pieces they left out for me, but they've arranged this organization, which created a nice sort of context to understand the work. And I think it inadvertently sort of forced me to create, a, I, it just kind of happened this way with where they had placed the prints, but I kind of felt like I was making almost like a, a round kind of progression of sort of where my work is. And I say progression not because like I did one before the other before the other, but more progression in terms of sort of where my training was and what my interests are and where they moved to and then where they doubled back into themselves. Um, but the other thing I want to say before I move on is that the design, my second thought was, oh my gosh, why did they put this so low? Because I, there's no way I'll ever show anything this, this low. And so I was like, okay, well I like the setup of everything else so much, I've got to I'll work with this. I'll, I'll, I'll give this a chance. And what was kind of amazing to me was by positioning it at this height, which I never worked on in that way, I never intended for it to be viewed that way, I came to understand these pieces in a very different way. Not in a better way, not in a worse way, just a very different way. And my perspective has changed on them as I sort of walked around them. So I think that that's one lesson in just being flexible. If I move across here, one of the things, as I was kind of, you know, it, you, another stage to, to a show like this is you always have to kind of come up with some kind of statement. And I have a hard time with that because I feel like if you came into my studio at any one time, I feel like you could essentially make a group show from just my work because it feels like, okay, you know, or I feel like, or it looks schizophrenic because it will be like, okay, well, this person's doing this. I don't know who that person is that's just doing this. And so a lot of my training started off doing figures. It's very traditional figure drawing, figure modeling. And the most recent pieces are probably, well, to be honest, they kind of pop around. But you can kind of see where this trans, there's a, almost a transition where some of the figurative elements want to come into some of these other elements that become increasingly, in some ways, more abstract. But like I said, it's hard for me to draw a trajectory because these are questions and impetus that sort of overlap, they interweave. I have a head in one corner that starts to talk to a castle with a trumpet in another corner, and then all of a sudden, this starts to come to mind. Um, so these, these elements overlap, but if I were to say that there is one sort of overarching theme to the work, it would have to be the form of silence. What is the form of silence? And what's the broad range of the form of silence? Silence can be very serene, tranquil, and contemplative. If you choose that as a state to be in. If you don't choose it and you're muted, you are not heard, you do not have a voice, the implications of that silence becomes very different. And I think that in the work that I, that I sort of strive towards, I like complicated, oppositions having to coexist. I love the notion from theological studies that grace and judgment have to coexist. In the theological terms, grace and judgment, they start from the same common place. The individual, the society, the culture is guilty. So what moves the divine's hand from grace to judgment, or judgment to grace. So in the work, as I'm doing the work, I'm often trying to sort of allow the, the context in which these things coexist, the brutal material of the cement, the poetic, perhaps, possibility of the touch, the isolation and mass of one area, but then the fine delicacy of another. The confinement or the containment of an element, but still a kind of grace in that, in some way, bound 
or um, a restrained aspect. So I kind of feel like I go from one area where it feels more peaceful and tranquil to another area that feels a little bit more brutal and muted, and then sort of end up with this area here, which is sort of distinctly um, funerary. <laughs> Um, and again, it's a kind of, it's a kind of uh, aim for a, a boldness of form and shape, but there's also a kind of, I hope a kind of beauty, a kind of transcendence in that brutishness, in that boldness, in that um, remembrance of something past. And in a lot of ways, it's informed mainly by uh, the use of contemporary architecture by architects like today, Orlando, um, of the way in which they create these very Sort of monumental spaces um, with very few uh, visual cues. So, um, um, maybe at this point I should just take some questions. I can donate them for directions. The first one's always the hardest. Yes. How um, do you think colors Oh uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I am um, notoriously in the department somewhat color phobic. <laughs> That's why I do sculpture and I do drawing. And my drawing students will know, you know, that I have a real thing right now. Like there are people in this department that have devoted their life to color, and I am distinctly not one of those people. <laughs> um, and you know, this is about as much color as my wardrobe gets, mm -hmm. and this is usually about my palette. Of activity. So when I started doing these, um, yeah, it was a real break for me. It was something that felt distinctly different. And I think that uh, the one thing I can say is that the color seems like it took me a lot of time to find this color, but I'm not, again, I'm not a colorist, so I'm not like, I don't have a palette of colors. I'm going to Michael's and I'm holding up ink <coughs> at the light and saying, yeah, this blue kind of works. For me, this blue on top of this blue will work better. So it kind of works that way. I'm not mixing the palette. What I have found, though, is this is <coughs> this image of the broken head. It's a self-portrait that I had modeled probably back in 1994 in, uh, in graduate school, 1993. And it was just an exercise. It's just something I'd done. I had this self-portrait. Um, you'll notice that the self-portrait is bold. Um, actually, back then, I actually did have hair. Um, but the bold aspect felt like more vulnerable. Anyway, so like Julie's uh, series on, on Babel, the Tower of Babel, this is my touchstone. I keep on coming back to this head over the years. And the way it transformed primarily was I had a mold of it, and I started to make castings of it, and then break them. Literally take a hammer to them and then put them back together. And long story short, it was very reflective of a place I was in my own personal history at that time, that that was in some way both uh, um, emotive, but also therapeutic, so the putting back together. So after having worked with this head theme for a while, the color started to become something I felt more comfortable with because it was a theme and an idea that I had already kicked around. So the inclusion of something like color started to become an amplification. Um, so this one here is called Pox, which was actually done right before COVID, <laughs> like literally the fall before COVID. Um, and this one I have to look at the, because I keep on changing the title, this one's called Bloom. And this trumpet form um, was a toy trumpet that I think one of my boys had uh, years ago that I made the mold of because I just loved the shape of it. And I think I kicked that mold around for a good 12 years um, before really using it. And then I just started to pop them out, um, break them, repair them, because obviously there's a, there's a dialogue with repair um, and the redemptive qualities of repair that are run through all of them. So like even something like this, a difficult project in this was learning how to, figuring out how to make the elements break them and glue them back together so that everything is kind of, everything is, is 
by necessity be created. Brian. Um, first of all, although as a bean carrier, there's a lot of color and to be joined from them, I do find no color color is in a way the most a significant one. The distraction, once you get rid of this distraction, the sen real sensitivity is gone from the field. So I would not say that there is this. Anyway, I think it's a very good thing. I'll get you to that thing. <laughs> <laughs> I have not covered the balance. <laughs> um, I find your work, um, 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 uh, work of a lot of metaphor. I'm very curious how you, and also the gravity seems to me is very important to you in terms of the curve, purely the turn between the capital peculiar balance gravity and also the stick vertical one is also strong with gravity and the diagonal one also is a strong gravity sense. But I'm very interested in how you choose those forms. It seems to me they're all um, metaphor oriented. Do you want to share something on that? Yeah I, I think that um, I think that the gravity is I think that as a sculptor, I feel like I spend a good portion of my life um, trying to battle gravity. <laughs> um, and yet, I think that later in this work, I feel like I've kind of come to terms of working with gravity. I think that the suspension of things, um, the way that gravity in a situation like this really is creating a tipping point, um, and the way that this kind of this element hovers to really convey a sense of mass in this vulnerable situation of uh, kind of like just kind of being cobbled together up there. The forms themselves, um, sometimes they take a uh, very deliberate sort of these being houses, um, in a sense. Um, uh, this and these forms, trying to find forms that are from time immemorial. In other words, the forms themselves feel like they could have been dug up from the archaeological balance on the bar they could be. So there's a kind of commonness to them, but commonness with a kind of ambiguous history. Um, and I think what's hardest for me at this point is just trying to allow the initial and the simple to be enough. And that's a difficult lesson to learn, I think, is trying to allow, because I, I kind of feel like I have versions of each of these that it just feels like too many parts started to sort of think try to go on their way on. Um, so metaphorically, yeah, I think that the sculptural metaphors have a lot to do with, you're right, the curved surface has a very different impact in relationship to the viewer than the right angle. Um, and yet, so many of the right angles or angles here are to create a sense of, um, convey a sense of stability. Again, like time and memorial, there's a sense of the Egyptian monuments just like, Bad, you know, very centered, very anchored. And so there's a sense of that trying to work against this notion of the more delineated and the more, in a sense, fragile state. Um, I, another question I had also related to color. <laughs> I just want to know your logic behind this uh, figure here. Like, mm -hmm. what, why? Yeah, this uh, this painting of it was kind of a kind of a, a late decision. Both of these pieces actually just started off in <laughs> demonstrations in my figure box class, <laughs> and then I became kind of like I'll do a quick demonstration, and then I put it off to the side, and I have it there, and I pull it back over to add to the demonstration when the students are developing. So I'm kind of doing a piece along with them. Um, and then I continued to work on them a little bit outside of class, and then I kind of came through and I did a lot of lopping off, I did a lot of cropping to kind of get the condensed idea that I wanted. The ink came because I kind of felt like when I was looking at the whole piece just in fire and ceramic, it extended too much. In other words, I didn't want to crop it to be just about this kind of quiet moment of the gaze. But I also didn't want it to be this fully kind of like 
it, the bottom part almost seemed distracting in some way. So when I painted the bottom of it and kind of divided it out, they start to be sort of the coherence of sort of two elements, two parts coming together. Well, you can ask me a question, Michael, but I want to say it's not easy to have you help. <laughs> uh, I, I was just wondering, um, you know, and, and I was thinking a lot, like Brian, about the, the gravity and kind of the, the weight of these things and the unifying attributes, and I'm also hearing you talk about the, the silence, and I like that idea. And I'm wondering if there's how, I don't know, formulate the question, has, is there a kind of way that the choice of materials is influenced by sounds, you know, and like how that's kind of developed over time and changed for you? Yes, let me see if I, let me see if I have that right, but I've always been drawn to material, like as a sculptor, that's what made me want to be a sculptor, tactile, the, the just essential qualities of different materials. Um, I was mentioning this to my sort of advanced drawing class this morning, that I just kind of feel like I want them to start developing work that's based on, first and foremost, a, a set of adjectives, a kind of tone, a kind of feel, a kind of, not the what of their work, but the how, how, not what are you talking about, but how you articulate that. And so I kind of feel like as things have gotten quieter, the mix of materials and how you use those materials has changed. There's less contrast in terms of the actual materials. The unification of materials have brought my ability to basically say, yes, this is kind of a very static and massive mass, but then that little string element starts to kind of have its place. By bringing the, 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 the idea of the silence and the centering of that silence into that piece, it means that instead of once upon a time I would use lead and wax and string and wood and all of these materials, that the jungle and the cacophony of that may have been appropriate for that work, but it was literally a <coughs> way of allowing the voice of a silent moment to be much more expressed. Is that, yeah? Julie, you have one last question. Well, it was a comment you put about the, the big female figure, but just when you were talking about how you, you liked that you were able to break out of being fixed with how her work was presented, mm -hmm. and so I kneeled down to really try to get a different perspective, and I really, there's something really enjoyable, like, I can't help but read that as a sarcophagus. Yeah. And, uh, but then the figures are above it, like almost like they're levitating out of it, yeah. and it feels very soulful, it feels silent. Mm -hmm. But I also really appreciate just looking, I constantly move up and down that female figure, and I love how refined the head is, mm -hmm. and then it just starts to break down mm -hmm. at the base, where it just yeah. thinks about, you know, thinking about our you know, mortality, mortality. Yeah. So it's yeah, and, and to be honest, this is kind of a premise for a lot of 19th century. 20th century sculpture, where it's really sort of pulling attention to, yes, there is a sort of rendered form and figure, but it's but made of clay, it's but made of, and it's somewhat not a, a, unlike the way that painters at the time have started to show the brush work a lot more evident. And so the process of the evidence of, of the process is certainly part of that, that, that language. And I think you're right. I think it shows the artifice of that reality, but it also shows the, the trajectory of the subject matter, the, you know, the, I agree that this is part of most hopefully the most beautiful morbid piece. Of <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd like to turn it over to Michael because I, I feel like you got, you're going to get short trip here. <laughs> Thank you. Purchase and MFA in photography from the Massachusetts College of Architecture. Yeah, I think we can go on over. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mind is just kind of going so much on what uh, Lisa and Ben said, uh, you know, and um, look, just looking at Lisa's pieces uh, and uh, 
thinking about how with the book, for instance, there's kind of the way you're you're combining sort of the front end and the back end of of what we look at. You know, um, I I feel like there's there's something to that. You know, that I'm trying to do in in my work here. Uh, you know, photography obviously it's it's not like looking at code. But it's it's very transparent in terms of the process. You know, you kind of take a picture, and then there it is. Uh, and much like the way Ben was talking about that, how you do something rather than what it is. Anyone who's who's in my class has probably you know already heard me say that like a lot of times this semester. Uh, and you know, it's that thought of all right, well here's this thing. So I started just collecting things around the neighborhood, and I'd say that's sort of the the basic like boring way that. It starts. Um, I had an idea to make photographs out of them. I didn't really know how or what they would look like. So they were just sort of there. And you know, there's that kind of back and forth of is this gonna is this gonna be anything interested? It's it's just kind of normal, it's rocks and you know, grass and seaweed and all of this stuff that you know you can make any number of photographs. There are a million of them already out there. I didn't want them to be just descriptive kind of close-up pictures. But I, I guess it was a matter of collecting these things that were sort of ordinary um, and uh, allowing that to sort of set up a, a game to say, well, what, what could the imagined life of these things be? What, what could they evoke by creating certain arrangements? And that's really where it started and just how it developed. And it's just kind of a, a play, you know? It's, it was a matter of, creating a format or making a container uh, to, to work within and then moving the things around. Um, and I guess I, I don't want to say too much, uh, but that was, that was kind of how it, how it evolved. A lot like in, you know, the way a, a child can kind of take a toy or really any old thing and build this whole elaborate world just, just from that. So it's not the object is completely arbitrary or insignificant, but it's uh, it is ordinary, you know. And I think that that's part of where it comes from. I mean, I see this with my five-year-old son all the time. It's like we'll get him all these cool toys, and he's playing with an egg board, you know. And that's like the most <laughs> the coolest thing, or the cushions of the couch, you know. So it's it's whatever's around, and then being able to build up of that somehow gives you more freedom, because. It didn't come in with with any kind of prescription, you know, the way maybe a, you know, the newest brand name, whatever toy. Uh, so it was it was kind of that process too. Um, uh, I don't know. If there's anything else I want to add? Uh, um, I just take some questions. I'm happy to talk about any of the works. Yeah. I, I but I'd love for you to discuss the sand one because that's always Uh -huh. Completely transforming something into something else on a piece. Uh huh. Well, th thank you. Yeah, and I, and I think that's that's a little you know I like the way you put that about you know trying to think of that for for all the pieces. How, what else is a thing? What else can it be? How can it sort of be both things that you, you read it and you know what it is as material, but then it can be suggestive in another way, um, and that's really what it became. It was sort of I had just. Collected a lot of sand, and I, I mean, yeah. I was just yeah, kind of like so moving it around and uh, <laughs> made a lot of really like dumb pictures, you know. <laughs> um, and you know, then just from kind of like dragging it and pushing it and moving lights around, uh, things start to peek out at you. Um, so I think that's also maybe some benefit to kind of getting these materials. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of a, I don't know if Maddie uh, Albany is here, but one of our BFA students, hi Maddie. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but we were talking last week, um, you know, about recent drawings, and you know, there was this idea where it was, these are just drawings, you know, I, I've done these a million times, and I don't know where to go from here. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost in that kind of humdrum place that we're gonna find our originality, I think, you know, where where we get to sort of be ourselves. The challenge, of course, is all right, in what in what way are you gonna push that so it doesn't feel humdrum anymore? 
How do you tweak it and make some challenge? How do you just move something? So it's creating these strictures. Okay, it's, you know, there's no color here. It, it, you know, in some ways, maybe I'm thinking like Ben, it's like, all right, just what can I take out? And then what do I have left? And how can I move this sand around? It's just sand. Uh, you know, and I think about how, you know, kind of the weather cycles and just by moving the materials and lights, how do you start to evoke those, those things, uh, those kind of weather patterns, those kinds of, uh, you know, light through water or through earth or, you know, in the sky. Um, and that's, <laughs> I, I just really like the, the stark blackness of it almost makes me think it's like a burn mark. Like it, it looks kind of like something's dissolving there. Or it could be like a, an island in the sky. Like it could be a build or it could be a take away. So yeah. I really just about it. Oh, thank you. Well, I like hearing that. And that's why I, uh, I'm kind of, kind of careful when I have to name the pieces. Mm -hmm. I'm not really good at naming things <laughs> either. So. Uh, you know, everything is like very just kind of what it is. But I feel like in that way, I don't want to, I don't want to be pushy with the title and, and influence the way you're supposed to see it. You know, that, oh, it's, it's a rain cloud or it's a sand, whatever, or it's a, it's a burn mark. But then all of those things can be there, uh, you know, through, through the imagery itself uh, and to just kind of put forward the, the actual materials that it is. Uh, but yeah, thanks. Yeah. Are there any pieces like that when you moved to the last before you had it here or something when I look at these, it seems like they're in a vacuum, like you somehow manipulated them to like that, I believe the stone pile looks like it's in space or the seaweed pile looks like it, you literally put it in like a microscope <laughs> thing. What was your process with like putting it in um, an area where it's not really a space that actually exists. Right, yeah. Good. Um, yeah, I guess when I was saying container, I didn't think of it literally in that way, you know, more of a kind of framework, but it but it could be that too. You know, it was it was just a small space, you know, with a couple of lights. I mean, I was in a room. <laughs> uh, and it was through kind of trying to put one thing against another and see what they, how they might speak to each other that I think the pieces find their way. So these are, you know, the, the seaweed piece is, uh, well, a number of these are, are sort of a combination of these found things outside and some drawing uh, or spray painting or something with a paper backdrop, you know, and that, that's been interesting to me for a while, kind of how, how you can render things in a photograph, you know, I just, love the quality of line that charcoal drawing makes and all of that stuff so i'm always like trying to be that a little bit and i really can't uh, <laughs> and you know just in terms of how i did it i i had put this stuff you know this kelp against a big piece of paper and just kind of stenciled it with the with spray paint and then you know had this other thing and you know i was trying to just photograph that thing some, in, sometimes I was just seeing like how much I could remove the actual object and get a photograph that might speak to it and then bring things back in, in other ways and where, where a balance might be found. But I like the way just putting it behind it, you know, and it's, it's basically resting on a piece of glass and then the, the drawing is like a, a few feet back uh, and then it's just kind of, you know, messing with the lights and stuff. Uh, so that it can feel sort of flat, but also, you know, kind of floating and that there's some depth and all of that. And it's a similar case with the, with the stones. Uh, that was actually, again, just kind of using what was there. I used the sand and had the sand kind of spread out on a piece of paper and spray painted it all to make that pattern, which just, you know, I, I just got some pleasure from the pattern. All right, so what, what is this going to look like as a picture? What can I do with that? Uh, and then kind of moving it around. And I had all these pictures of stones that were just kind of sitting there, you know? Um, and then it was a matter of arranging and seeing and then putting this thing behind it and lighting it from behind 
that it felt like it started to do that thing where it was maybe becoming something else. It felt more monumental than it was, um, you know, that I liked that the sand, you know, was somehow connected to the stones themselves in an elemental way. So it's, it's a bit like, uh, you know, the earth and sky are sort of dreaming of each other and it can be sky or it could be water. And then it's again, a kind of uh, illusionistic depth that's starting to come through there. And, you know, my wife was pregnant at the time, and I don't know, there was something that really struck me about the way the stones were arranged when I looked at that picture, because I had all different arrangements, um, and it, it, it felt somehow connected human-like to me when I saw it. So. The painting process there is the process of capturing light and especially the view of the photographer. So, uh, I mean, what did you say? Did you sort of tweak the uh, painting process to fit your original uh, perspective on the photo, or do you have to see another perspective that is not your focus? Did, so, did I, did I adjust the, the process to so get the, the printing print? process? Did you, uh, Tweak the photos again and again to get your own mm -hmm. perspective, or do you see another, uh, another perspective that you uh, try to work on? As I was working on yeah. it, I mean, um, it's, it's maybe some of both. Uh, you know, yet yeah, there, there was some adjusting, and that was really to different extents. Um, just in terms of, you know, kind of start to finish, the, the process. Different pictures are made with different cameras. Some are shot with a really large uh, format film camera, mm -hmm. and then those negatives are scanned in. You know, those start off, they're black and white negatives. There's no way there can be color in them. I mean, that's just, that's a choice made at the beginning. Once they're scanned, then you have them in Photoshop and you can do, do things to them. But generally, it's, for me, mostly like cleaning up the dust and, you know, getting the contrast and all that. Uh, some of them are digital capture, which then, um, you know, I've worked with more just in the last couple of years, really. So there was a little more, a different room to, to play and think about the images. So some are actually combined, and they might be two or three or more images that then I kind of merged together. And that was, again, just kind of playing and almost thinking about, all right, it's an object, and it's maybe like uh, sort of an imaginary landscape or, or, you know, almost like that. And so, you know, in doing that, uh, it became something that didn't really exist when I, when I shot it. Uh, and then in terms of printing, that's got to find its way too. you know, these, I, I mean, I knew I, I envisioned them in black and white, even though the digital process just records it in color. I wasn't really concerned with that. So that if you were to look at the original file, I guess it's just all crazy, but uh, but, um, but then there's some adjustment, you know, um, to, to just find the right way, I suppose, you know, and the right, uh, levels of contrast. So it's a hard thing to, to describe, you know, there was one, uh, this picture, for instance, I thought I had it finished at an earlier date. And then it's kind of one of those things where I looked at it, I worked on it for hours all day and I printed it and I'm like, that's killer, you know, great. And then the next day I was like, this is awful. <laughs> because it was just like, it was so dark and there was so much contrast to it. It just didn't, it didn't feel like the thing felt maybe when I was, when I was shooting it, like it, it wasn't speaking in that way, but that makes sense. Um, you know, the, the, the tone of it was just much different. Just like we kind of, you know, we use those words so much with our, our own language. So when we think about tone, it's kind of a physical thing, but it's just how we speak. If you think of your tone of voice, I think it's, there's so many analogs to that. So I kind of went back to the drawing board and reworked it some. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.